In this video, we're gonna prove a few more algebraic properties of M forms. But before we do that, let's look at some definitions. So let's recall that an M form on TPRN is a multilinear alternating function, omega, whose entries are M different vectors, all that are N dimensional, and the output are just real numbers. So in some previous videos, I described what the word multilinear means and the word alternating, so I'll let you guys check that out if you need to. Furthermore, we have argued before that the space of M forms has a basis, which is given by these elementary M forms that are dxi1 wedge all the way up to dxim, where one is less than or equal to i1, which is less than i2, all the way up to im, which is less than or equal to n. And furthermore, in the last video, we proved that this space is M, sorry, n choose m dimensional. And just to see what exactly those elementary forms do, we kind of recall this down here. So if we've got m vectors, v upper one up to v upper m in TPRN, then we have dxi1 wedge all the way up to dxim evaluated at these m vectors is the determinant of the following matrix. So we take the, the rows are given by these input vectors, uh, vk, and then the columns are given by the entries. And so these entries are pulled out depending on the indices here. So we did some examples of this um, in a previous video, so I'll let you guys look at that if you need to. Okay, great. So now we wanna do this following proposition, which says that if alpha is a K form and beta is an L form, then beta wedge alpha is equal to minus one to the KL alpha wedge beta. So we're gonna use a little bit of a fact from abstract algebra here, and that is that um, any permutation on the set um, one up to M can be written as a product of transpositions which are of the form um, j comma j plus one. In other words, we're just switching the jth term with the j plus first term. So that means that if we get a handle with what's happening when we switch something like this in one of these elementary M forms, then we have a general strategy for describing what happens when we do any sort of switch. So now what I wanna do is start with an elementary M form where these two guys have been switched. In other words, in other words, dxij and dxij plus one. So here, we're gonna start off here, dxi1, that hasn't been changed, wedge, all the way up to dxij plus one, that has been switched with dxij. So those two are the guys that have been switched from their original positions, and now we're gonna wedge this all the way up to dxim. So how you wanna read this is that this is in the same order as it is over here in the definition, except these two guys have been switched here, the ij term and the ij plus one term. Okay, but recall that these elementary M forms are functions, and so in order to see how this function differs from the one that hasn't been switched, we need to stick something into the function and look at the outputs on both sides. So what we'll stick into this function are these M vectors, V1 up to Vm. Great. But now we know that that is exactly equal to the determinant of this matrix uh, V1, I1, all the way up to V1 I J plus one, and then V1 I J, and then all the way up to V1 I M. So how you read this is this first row comes from the first vector, and then we're taking these entries out of this first vector. So the I1 entry because of this, all the way up to the I J plus one entry because of this, then the I J entry all the way up to the I M entry. But then we do that for all of the input vectors of which there are M. So our last row will be given by V upper M I1 all the way up to V upper M I J plus one and then V upper M I J and then all the way up to V upper M I M. So there we've got a determinant of an M by M matrix. Now the next thing that we wanna do is to put this back in terms of the elementary one form where this has not been switched. That's equivalent to doing a column swap on this matrix. 
But then from linear algebra, if you swap two columns that are next to each other in a matrix, then the determinant changes by a minus sign. So in other words, we're gonna do that column swap and we'll pick up a minus sign. And now we have these vectors kind of in the so-called correct order. So we've got VI1 all the way up to V1 and then IJ and then V1 I J plus one, all the way up to V one I M. And then we've got something similar for all of the rows. So in other words, we've swapped these columns back into this ascending order. Okay, um, good. Now the next thing that we wanna notice is this is exactly equal to the elementary one form with these not switched evaluated on this set of vectors. In other words, here we have DX I one wedge all the way up to dxij wedge dxij plus one wedge all the way up to dxim and then on our vectors v1 up to vm. Great. So a single switch will pick up a single minus sign. I forgot my minus sign there. And so since this is happening for arbitrary inputted vectors, we know that this M form is equal to the negative of this M form. So in other words, if we switch two of these guys that are next to each other, we pick up a minus sign. And that's all the preparation we need to prove this prop position in general, and that's what we'll do now. Okay, so we did a little bit of a preparation and now we're ready to prove this prop proposition in general. So let's go ahead and set alpha equal to this sum over a i1 up to a i up to ik of dx i1 wedge all the way up to dx i k. Okay, great. So recall that these dx i ones up to dx i k will form a basis for a k form. So every alpha can be written in that form. And now we'll write beta in a similar way. So that'll be the sum over all of these b j1 up to um, j l and then dx j1 wedge all the way up to dxjl. And now the next thing that we want to see is if we do this uh, product between beta and alpha. So in other words, if we have beta wedge alpha, this is now going to be a double sum. So just to reiterate, this is a sum over all multi indices i and this is a sum over all multi indices j. So this is gonna be a double sum over multi-indices i and j. Those are both finite sums, so we don't have to worry about convergence or anything. Okay, so now notice this is gonna be a, i, b, j. So I'll just collapse all those multi-indices into the capital I and capital J for the coefficients. And then the next thing we'll have is dx, j, one, wedge, all the way up to dx, j, l, wedge, dx, i, one, all the way up to dx i k. So that's exactly what we get if we take this guy and wedge it into this guy, but in the opposite order. Now the next thing that we wanna do is reorder this so that all of the dx i um, ones through i k's are to the left of everything else. So in other words, we'll take this thing and move it all the way over. We'll take the next one and move it all the way over and we'll take all of these and move them all the way over. So now notice what we're doing is we're taking this dxi1 and we're moving it past L of these dxj's and then we'll take dxi2 and move it past L of those dxj's all the way up to dxik. So we are taking k different things and moving them past um, L different things. We'll notice moving each of them past L different things will pick up a minus one to the L. So maybe let's uh, see that with just one case. So we have minus one to the L and then the sum over I and then the sum over J of A, I, B, J. And then we're gonna have DX, I, one, wedge, DX, J, one, wedge, all the way up to DX, J, L, wedge, DX, I2 wedge all the way up to dx i k. And so that's what we get from moving this dx i1 across. Notice as it moves past each, it picks up a minus sign, but that means it picks up L minus, the si minus signs in total. In other words, we have minus one to the L.
But now we're gonna continue to do that and we'll pick up a minus one to the L for every one of these that we move over. But how many do we move over in the end? We move uh, K over. So we've got K copies of minus one to the L. In other words, that's the same thing as minus one to the KL times the reordered term alpha wedge beta. Okay, good. Now before we leave this, I wanna look at a very, very quick corollary to this. And that is if um, K is odd, we have alpha wedge itself is equal to zero. So that's pretty easy to see because if you switch alpha with alpha here, you obviously end up with the same thing but this proposition up here tells you that you should end up with the negative. But the only thing that is its own negative is zero. So we have alpha wedge itself is zero if k is odd. That may not be the case if k is even. Okay, so I'll clean this up and then we're gonna look at one more thing. For our next proposition, which we're not gonna prove super carefully, but we will sketch a proof for a very simple case and that proof extends pretty easily. That is that this wedge product distributes over the addition. So here we'll do proof, and we'll really do proof by simple example. So I mean, that would give you like a C plus in class, but after presenting this simple example, I'll kind of wave my hands at what you would have to do in general. So let's look at DX wedged with DY plus DZ. And so we'll start off just looking at this as a product of one forms, which means we need to see what it does to a pair of vectors. So let's say we've got a pair of vectors V and W. So since this is a product of one forms, it gives us a two form. And we know that this is going to be equal to the determinant of the matrix given by this first one form DX acting on V. So let's just write that DX acting on V and then this second one form acting on V. So that's gonna be dy plus dz acting on V. And then the same thing acting on W in the second row. So here we'll have dx acting on W and then dy plus dz acting on W. Great. Now the next thing that we can use is here we're taking the sum of two one forms and we know how to take the sum of functions and that is we can break this up into pieces. So we'll have this is dx acting on v and then dy, dy acting on v plus dz acting on v. And then we'll have something similar in the second row. So here we'll have dx acting on w and then dy acting on w plus dz acting on w. Now all of these are numbers. So dxv is a number, dyv is a number, and dzv is a number. Now the next thing that we wanna do is use this trick involving the determinant and a sum happening in one column. So you can expand this out with the determinant uh, formula and see exactly what's happening, but it's not too hard to gather that what you will get is dx acting on v, dy acting on v, and then dx acting on w, dy acting on w, plus the determinant of the same thing, but with dz in the second column. So we're here we'll have dx acting on v, dy acting on, dz acting on v, and then finally dx acting on w, dz acting on w. So this is called like the determinant sum property. And actually I have a whole video, it happens to be, be about some Fibonacci number identities that you could check out where we prove this more carefully. But the great thing to notice here is that this guy is equal to dx wedge dy acting on vw. And then this guy right here is dx wedge dz acting on vw. So that establishes this distributive rule in this small case. So how would you do this more generally? Well, you would first take these forms alpha, beta, and gamma, and you would write them as linear combinations of the elementary forms. And then you would prove a similar thing to what we did right here, but for an arbitrary elementary form. But what's gonna happen is exactly what we saw right here. In other words, we'll use this determinant sum property in a column. So I think those details are really nice to check and I think maybe uh, it would be a good exercise. Okay, that's a good place to stop.